you're the expert here when it comes to pneumonia. Some people may not know what pneumonia is. So what is this pneumonia? Our lungs usually don't contain any germs. When our lungs are invaded by those germs, that germ could be a virus, that germ could be a fungus. There is a war that goes on uh, inside those lungs. And the end result of that war is a disease we call pneumonia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or whatever time that you're listening to this podcast. Or for those of us who are watching, welcome to the Health Podcast. My name is Helen Shikanda. I am a science reporter from the Nation Media Group, and I have very interesting guests today. And I was just telling them before we got to this place that it's my time to learn, and I know you all are going to learn from them. So we are going to talk about a very interesting topic and as we've already heard from the news, we've already seen everywhere that El Nino is coming. And we know that when El Nino comes, it's the cold season and some diseases are likely to come about during this the cold season. And one of those diseases is what we are going to talk about today. And we have specialists, experts who have been doing this for a while. We are going to talk about pneumonia. And we have three amazing guests that I'll let them introduce themselves, starting from the one on my left. Welcome to studio. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Elijah Matolo. I'm the medical practice uh, manager at Old Mutual Health Insurance. I'm a medical doctor by training with a specialization in health economics. Uh -huh. Thank you for having us today. Amazing. Happy to have you here today. Yes, and the one that I can't see, but I can hear his voice. My name is uh, Dr. Jeremiah Chakaya. I am also a medical doctor, and I am a physician by training and uh, a pulmonologist. I practice pulmonology. Now, what is pulmonology? It is uh, expertise in uh, care, prevention, and treatment of lung diseases. Uh -huh. Thank you for elucidating on what pulmonology is, because I'm, I'm sure not so many people know about that. Thank you for that. And the last guest to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Karuma. Uh -huh. uh, I'm a registered pharmacist and the chief pharmacist Good Life Pharmacy. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Karibu sana. So we'll start with you, Dr. Chakaya, our pulmonologist, because you're the expert here when it comes to pneumonia. Some people may not know what pneumonia is. Even the spelling of pneumonia uh, here in the village, some people say pneumonia and so many other pronunciations. So what is this pneumonia? Our lungs usually don't contain any germs. Uh, in our language, we say they are sterile. And if the lungs are invaded by a germ, that germ could be a bacteria, that germ could be a virus, that germ could be a fungus, any of those uh, little animals that uh, uh, we call germs. When our lungs are invaded by those germs, there is a war that goes on uh, inside those lungs, and the end result of that war is a disease we call pneumonia. Now, this pneumonia uh, will be characterized by certain things, Usually, the person who has pneumonia will cough. That person will have pain in the chest. Usually, that pain is not frontal. It is on the sides of the chest. And usually, that pain could be, um, tends to increase when one takes a deep breath or when one uh, sneezes or when one coughs. Usually, most people with a pneumonia will also have fever, so a body temperature elevation, and they may have some difficulties in breathing. That's what characterizes pneumonia. A doctor should not make, or a clinical, or a, or a clinician should not make a diagnosis of pneumonia ordinarily unless there are those symptoms. And two, there is some form of imaging of the chest. So imaging means an X-ray has been taken or a CT scan has been taken, and it shows features that are compatible with pneumonia. In the absence of an X-ray, you need very special skills to be able to pick out certain signs that tell you that this individual has pneumonia. So in simple terms, pneumonia is inversion of the lung by germs, and that war between your body and the germs is pneumonia. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Chakaya. You've talked about this invisible war that our lungs fight, and it's a war between the germs and the lungs. So I'd like to know what really causes this war? Like, what do you do? What predisposes you to get to this point that there's a war internally in your lungs? So this is an invasion. It's a, maybe think, think, think of it as um, a terrorist attack or something like that. You know, you are... Or, or, or thieves have come into your house and, 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 and you start fighting them. And, and usually when you start fighting um, fighting um, terrorists or thieves, sometimes there is damage to uh, the house which you had not intended to have. And that's exactly what happens in our bodies. These little animals we call germs are not meant to be in the lung. And when they get into the lung, we mount a defense We we activate our defense system. We call it our immune system. When we activate that immune system, uh, we kill these germs or we try and kill these germs. But in the process of killing these germs, we can also damage our own lungs. So our immune system uh, can also lead to some damage to our lungs. That's the process. They should not be there. These germs should not be there, but when they are there, they elicit this process. Uh, and that process then is what is called pneumonia. There are certain people who are more likely to get pneumonia than others. Anyone can get pneumonia. So it's not that it's a disease confined to a certain groups of people and not others. But there are those that have a higher risk of developing pneumonia than others. For example, very young people or very old people or people who have got some uh, problems with their defense system. If you are H living with HIV, for example, or if you have a uh, uh, chronic disease of the lung, or you have a uh, chronic disease of the heart, and so on and so forth. There's a whole long list of things that can happen, uh, or rather can lead to an increased risk of, uh, of pneumonia. Okay. Thank you so much. I've heard of people who Maybe their pneumonia was discovered late and you've just talked about it not being ordinarily discovered. Maybe by a general practitioner, there are some tests that need to be done. So what are some of the symptoms that people need to look at when they're going to hospital? What should doctors do to diagnose them with pneumonia? So the usual, the usual way in which pneumonia will show itself, uh, the usual way in which you will know that you have pneumonia, is through the presence of symptoms. Symptoms is what you feel. And the most common symptoms are cough, fever, breathing problems, and pain in the chest. These are the most common symptoms. You don't need to have all of them. Sometimes it's only one or two of them that are there, but those are the most common symptoms. There could be other symptoms, headaches, uh, joint pains, muscle pains, fatigue, and so on and so forth. Um, usually for most people with pneumonia, the problem is short-lived. So if you go to a doctor and you've had a problem for the last two, three months or so, you're unlikely to have a pneumonia. These are short-lived problems. So usually symptoms have been there for days, maybe maximum one or two weeks. Uh, so uh, symptoms that come rapidly and are characterized by the presence of things like cough, fever, chest pains, and shortness of breath uh, that developed just a few days ago. Chances of that person having pneumonia are high. Mm -hmm. Someone may ask, you know, you may just have a, co a cough and maybe it's just common cold. It could be caused by something else. How then do you distinguish that this is actually pneumonia and this is just a normal cold? I need to go to hospital. What makes you give you that need to go to hospital because this is something serious? So um, the way we tolerate uh, things is different from one person to another. So I might get cough, fever, pains, and all those things that are characteristic of pneumonia. But I don't go to hospital quickly because it's like, okay, this is just the usual thing. It will go away in a few, uh, a few days or, or so. So, however, I think it's really important that if you develop symptoms that are suggesting you could have pneumonia, you need to seek medical care early. Because pneumonia can kill, 
in the world today, every year, slightly less than 3 million people die of pneumonia. So it can't kill. And therefore, the earlier one goes to a healthcare facility for evaluation, the better. Now, what should the doctor look, look for or what should the clinician look for? Having heard the story, the doctor will examine that individual. And there are certain things that should be, if you don't have an x-ray, for example, there are certain things that would suggest that this individual may have pneumonia. Um, there are certain sounds that uh, if the doctor puts uh, their stethoscope on your chest, they may hear certain sounds, uh, and those sounds might uh, identify you as uh, a potential cause of pneumonia. But the confirmation that there is actual pneumonia should come from some form of X-ray. So you get a chest X-ray, and a chest X-ray shows a shadow on your lung, we know for sure you have a pneumonia. If you have not had an imaging study, you have not had an X-ray or a CT scan, the doctor can only assume it could be pneumonia, but they don't have proof that it is pneumonia. So you need an X-ray to prove that this is a pneumonia. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's a wake-up call to people who shun the hospital, that they'd rather wait when it's worse, the situation is worse before going to hospital. But when it comes to pneumonia, you've just heard from Dr. Chakaya that you need to get medical attention quite early. And the next thing we'll be talking about is sort of a cousin to pneumonia, which is influenza. And maybe you can just explain what really is the difference between influenza and pneumonia and how are they related? Okay, this is very important. I said at the beginning that pneumonia is a condition in which the lungs have been invaded by germs. And I say that those germs could be viruses, they could be bacteria, they could be other types of viruses or, or other types of germs. Among the list of uh, viruses that can cause pneumonia, you have in there a germ called influenza. Just like the other germs, uh, one of those germs is what we've been struggling with now for the last three years all over the world, the COVID-19 thing. That causes a pneumonia, but that pneumonia is caused by another, a, 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 a different virus. So influenza is a virus that has been associated with infections in the breathing system, or what sometimes we call the respiratory system. Now, that infection, which is invasion of your respiratory system, your nose, your throat, your airways, and uh, up to the lung, that, uh, that infection can lead to a very simple cold-like, you know, a flu-like uh, problem, or could actually lead to a very serious illness, which is influenza pneumonia. So when we talk about influenza, we are talking about a respiratory or a breathing system illness that is caused by the influenza virus. And the range of problems that you can get can be from simple flu-like problem to a very serious pneumonia that can kill. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Dr. Chakaya. Before we come to Dr. Matolo, I'd like to ask Dr. Chakaya, we've talked about mostly the gloom and doom of pneumonia and influenza but I know there's a solution to that, and that solution is a vaccine. And we have the pneumococcal vaccine and the influenza vaccine. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. How does it work? Why do people need it here? So fortunately for us, for both the uh, influenza and the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia, if you have a pneumonia, uh, the most common cause of the most common bacterial cause of that pneumonia is a germ that is called this pneumococcus. And it causes in our country, for example, 50% of all pneumonias in this country among adults may be caused by the pneumococcus. This is a specific germ that is among the list of germs that cause pneumonia. It is one of the most common causes of pneumonia in the world and is responsible for almost 50% of all the deaths in the world due to 
pneumonia. And so, fortunately, there is a vaccine against this, this pneumococcus. That vaccine is called the pneumococcal vaccine. And everyone who has certain risk factors who is likely to end up if they get a pneumonia, for example, that is due to this jam, every person who has got uh, factors that could lead to very severe disease when they get this pneumonia should be vaccinated. Similar thing for the influenza thing. The influenza is just one of the viruses that can cause problems in the breathing system. However, it is the most common virus that causes problems in the world, including our own country here. So influenza is the most common viral infection and it can lead to outcomes that are poor, which is death. And for that reason, we also have vaccination against influenza. So those two, pneumococcus and influenza vaccinations are very important to be given to people who could, if they get any of those pneumonias due to those two, if they get any of those, they could end up with a bad outcome. Those individuals should be vaccinated against uh, those two germs. Okay. Thank you so much. Before we come back to you on how the vaccines work, I'd like Dr. Matolo to chime in a little bit because I know our president and even the health cabinet secretary have been talking about preventive health care and primary health care and whatnot, empowering community health promoters. They're called promoters these days, not volunteers. So I'd like to know why is it important to have preventive health care? And I know vaccines are a way of preventive health care. Why is it important? Uh, thanks a lot. So uh, prevention or preventive healthcare uh, set of uh, healthcare services that are meant to uh, prevent a disease from occurring in the in the first place. So we talk about uh, prevention being uh, better than cure, and that is uh, both from a financial perspective. It costs you less if you prevent than uh, if you're curing it, but also in terms of uh, how severe a disease becomes, it's usually better if you're uh, going to catch it earlier. So uh, prevention, there are usually three main types. So it's either primary prevention, secondary prevention, or tertiary prevention. So for primary prevention, you are you are trying to uh, prevent a disease from coming in the first place. And that one, uh, you have uh, two main things. That is uh, vaccination, which uh, if you're getting uh, vaccines like what uh, Dr. Ari has spoken about, it will prevent you from getting pneumonia in the first place or prevent uh, you from getting uh, influenza. The other bit about primary prevention is uh, promoting healthy living. So when you tell people do not smoke because smoking uh, causes many uh, diseases. So on the secondary prevention, what you're trying to do is you're trying to catch diseases when it's very early. So the disease process has already started, but you're trying to catch it when it's still very uh, early and you can screen for many conditions, including even cancer. If you catch it early, then you're able to treat and even cure it. Then our finally on tertiary prevention is uh, the disease is already established and uh, it's already causing symptoms, but you're trying to prevent it from getting worse. So assuming a patient who has uh, hypertension, so it's a care that you're giving to prevent them from getting complications like stroke or uh, kidney disease. So uh, prevention is important because it improves the health of uh, the, the population and it's also cheaper uh, for any uh, anyone, uh, both at the household level but also at a national level. It will It is going to be uh, cost us less if we focus on uh, prevention of DD rather than a uh, cure, uh, curative part. Uh -huh. If there's one thing that you, my listeners, should get from this is that old adage from primary school that prevention is better than cure. And Dr. Matel Matolo has just explained why this is important. And I'd just like to know, I know you're from Old Mutual and it has a package on the pneumococcal vaccine that Dr. Chakaya has been talking about. I feel like that is really such a good thing. So tell us about this um, package on getting insured by Old Mutual. So well, what we have uh, as part of our health benefits, uh, well, one of the things is that we noticed that previously we used to focus a lot on curative, 
But when we look at the preventive side, uh, one of the things we noticed is, and specifically for patients with chronic uh, conditions, uh, pneumonia is it becomes a bit more prevalent. Uh, so patients with uh, kidney disease, patients with heart diseases. Uh, and so what we've done is uh, we we went out there and said, how do we prevent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we approached some of the companies uh, that make these vaccines because the vaccines, the prices were a bit uh, out of reach for, uh, for most people. So we had a discussion with uh, Pfizer, who are the ones who make uh, the vaccine that we are offering uh, our clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, they managed to negotiate uh, a, a very good price that now made it uh, possible to roll it out to everyone who needed it. Mm -hmm. So our vaccination program uh, has two vaccines. So the first one is a pneumococcal vaccine for uh, which prevents against pneumonia caused by uh, the pneumococcal uh, bacteria, but we also provide uh, influenza vaccine, which prov uh, prevents against uh, influenza, uh, the, the disease. So uh, there are specific eligibility criteria. So we decided to focus on those people who needed it the most. So these are the, the seniors, uh, people aged uh, 65 years and above, and also those who are living with uh, various chronic conditions. So chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease, and several other uh, chronic conditions. So it's a, it's a partnership that we are working with the Good Life Pharmacy. So, uh, and part of the reason why we decided to work with Good Life Pharmacy is because they have a widespread, they have very many branches where our members can get access to this. We also wanted to make it easy. You now people usually do not want to go to hospital. Yeah, so instead of asking them go to hospital to get vaccinated, we brought the vaccine closer to where they are. So most people will come across a, a, a pharmacy when you're just doing your day to day. Maybe you've gone shopping, you'll pass a, a, a pharmacy by. So said, let's make it as convenient as possible and also make it as easy uh, for our members to access uh, this uh, vaccine. So it's a service we are, we are, we are paying for it uh, fully from uh, for all our members who are eligible and who are covered by uh, all mutual health. Uh -huh. yeah. I think that's a, that's a good idea. And you've talked about Good Life Pharmacy. And unless you're living under the cave, maybe you've not heard of Good Life Pharmacy. But I know all or most Kenyans have heard of Good Life Pharmacy. And we have the chief pharmacist from Good Life Pharmacy here with us, Dr. Karuma. So, Dr. Karuma, how do people get these vaccines from your pharmacies? Is it administered intravenously or how is it administered by the way oh it's administered intravascularly mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, not intravenous it's mm -hmm. intravascularly mm -hmm. normally on the arm mm -hmm. uh, not a painful job mm -hmm. so nobody should be scared about getting it yeah uh, generally you don't expect a lot of side effects not no uh, not a lot of pain on the injection site maybe for a few people but gen for most people mm -hmm. you get the you get the vaccination mm -hmm. and you go, you go back to your office mm -hmm. yeah so people with trypanophobia like me who are afraid of needles should not be afraid to come for the pneumococcal vaccine or the influenza vaccine, it right? It even help to not uh, get out of that uh, phobia of needles. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's, not, it's not that bad. Okay. Yes. So I understand that not everyone can get it. So what's the screening process like? How do you ascertain that this person is supposed to get it, this one cannot get it? So for the flu vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, uh, generally anyone can get the flu vaccine as long as you're past the, uh, six months of six months of age mm -hmm. and onwards. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone can get it unless you have a, a allergies. You react to any of the ingredients in those vaccines. And number two, uh, for in some cases of pregnancy, you might not be able to get the uh, flu vaccine. For pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Uh, anyone from the age of uh, two months or two months all the way to uh, two years, uh, let's say everyone can get that vaccine, yeah. but it's targeted to young, to the young and the elderly. Yes. So that the people who are, who would suffer uh, pneumonia most mm -hmm. get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have a lot of, uh, uh, the amount of vaccines being produced are not very many. Yeah. So we want them targeted to the right people. Mm -hmm. But if you come to a pharmacy, even off those ages and you want to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. we will still get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I'll go back to Dr. Chakaya. I had, you talked about the war, the internal war, the invisible war, like a terrorist attack. So the vaccines now come in as a solution. 
how do they work in your in our bodies so basically vaccines work by imitating what your own defense system should be doing like i said you have a defense system it's a very elaborate system it recognizes foreign things so uh, if we are thinking about al shabab immediately they enter this country somebody recognizes the defense system of this country recognizes that al shabab are right and there will be a war between uh, us and our defense system and al shabab and that's exactly the same thing that happens in our bodies that war is fought in many fronts it is fought by um our soldiers that are non specific they fight everything and anything uh and they are also our soldiers uh, these are cells that uh, we have in our bodies soldiers that are very specific we also produce chemicals we call them antibodies we call them uh, um um you know all sorts of names uh but uh, all this war uh this this combination of wars is what uh, uh or mechanisms of fighting uh foreign things that are entering our bodies is directed by the defense system and our vaccines mimic basically uh stimulate our defense system to do exactly that so for example the pneumococcal vaccine will stimulate the production of antibodies antibodies are chemicals that will uh, identify when 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 they are attached to uh, the germ that we call the pneumococcus they attach themselves to that uh, to that uh, germ and that germ then is killed by your uh, your body cells so it's like you 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 get um, uh, you get this uh, this bad guy who has come in you place something on that individual and your policeman can identify that fellow in uh, easily and come and grab him and destroy him mm-hmm. that's what uh, antibodies do yeah. uh, and the influenza vaccine works in the same way so basically what these vaccines do is to stimulate your own immune system defense system to be able to do what that immune system would be able to do naturally now unfortunately for us human beings these germs had ways had developed ways of uh, avoiding our defense systems they're very clever they're very smart these germs they come in ordinarily you don't recognize that they're there uh, they confuse your defense system and eventually you get disease but with a vaccine we have identified the best ways in which our bodies fight this uh, uh this um, uh, this germs and that way of fighting that germ is what is enhanced by the vaccine so that you have better success in fighting the germ in case the germ arrives and usually then that protection uh that defense capacity that you have uh, you have achieved is uh, there for a period of time for the pneumococcal vaccine for example that say uh, uh, enhanced capacity to fight the pneumococcus is present in your body after the vaccination for up to 5 years as it were mm-hmm. i'm not sure if it's just me but i feel like vaccines are that friend that you need they'll fight for you anything that is said against you they'll be there to fight for you so i know even if we talk about friends and the war and everything there's some people who doubt other people and there's some people who doubt vaccines so that means that there's a myths clouded around all these things do you know some of these myths dr chakaya so um the vaccine story has been uh, um has been uh, affected by myths misconceptions for a very long time uh human beings um uh, sometimes tend to be um afraid of things because you don't know what the long term effects of something might be human beings also sometimes feel like if i'm given a vaccine it may give me a uh, very bad side effects and it could kill me and like all human inventions yes sometimes for certain people bad things have happened so we cannot say that vaccines are completely innocent that they will never give you side effects and and stuff like that uh like all good things everything in this world is poisonous to some extent it depends on uh my body uh the way my body is made and uh, and 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 uh, and the way i react to it 
But generally speaking, vaccines are safe. They go through a very thorough development process. They have to be tested for effectiveness. Do they work? And they also have to be tested for, uh, to, for, for safety. No product that is coming out of the pharmaceutical industry should be given to any human being anywhere in the world without confirmation that one, it works, and two, it is safe. But having said that, you need to know that occasionally things do happen, and they, uh, and they happen a lot, because there's no perfect solution. Even eating a lot of ugali can give you problems. Uh, the thing that we all think, oh, it's innocent, and we love it, and what have you, it can give you problems. So there are things that happen uh, sometimes. But generally speaking, uh, vaccines are very safe and very effective. I know Old Mutual has done a great job in introducing that as one of the health benefits to her customers. So I'd just like to know, just taking up from where Dr. Chakaya has just said about the myths and misconceptions, how are you demystifying this? Is it easy to convince people to get the pneumococcal or the influenza vaccine? How do you make them see the need of getting this vaccine? Uh, thanks a lot. So we have been at <clears throat> Uh, doing a lot of uh, awareness uh, campaigns. We've been uh, sharing information uh, that is uh, written and through either emails, we've been sharing uh, e-flyers, we've also been sending uh, SMSs, both informational but also some uh, to uh, targeted to the, the eligible populations. So you said that we are targeting uh, those who are above the age of uh, 65 and those who have uh, various uh, uh, chronic conditions. Yeah, so we, we've been doing that, but uh, it's it's not, I wouldn't say it's been easy. The, the uptake, uh, the, the initial one has been good, but there's still many more people that we haven't uh, reached. And that's why we are, we, we are trying to continue creating that awareness. So some of the uh, concerns raised, of course, uh, it's a question around their uh, safety. Uh, because we all, we also do we also call to just get feedback from our our members. So there's always uh, a question around safety, but that has been uh, uh, spoken about by Daktari. I think the other question is also uh, about uh, recommendation. So when we tell our members uh, you need to get vaccinated, some of them say y yes, uh, thank you, but let me first go and consult my doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if their doctor d does not uh, approve of it a good recommendation yeah and not just saying it's okay you can get vaccinated mm -hmm. actually giving a strong recommendation that yes i think you will benefit uh, from getting vaccinated so that that becomes it i think there's also a lot of uh, myths also uh, going around uh, saying that you know uh, you vaccines do very many different things I think there's also a question around uh, cost, especially for uh, patients who have chronic conditions tend to spend a lot of their uh, of their covers for their for their management. You know, the day to day. If I need medication, if I need to pay consultations to see my specialist. So sometimes they'll feel no, they, this money could be spent doing that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's there's also the question around uh, do do they feel they can afford. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, and generally just uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people hear about it, but they really need someone coming to them and explaining to them. So number one, uh, what is a vaccine? What does it do? And why do you need it? And mm -hmm. what are the uh, benefits and the uh, basically the potential risk? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is really around uh, awareness uh, at the individual level, but also recommendation at uh, the healthcare practitioner. Mm -hmm. So if they get a strong recommendation, then we know uh, that they, they do take it up. I think the other bit is now around how do you also create awareness? We will find, no, not awareness, but access. So uh, we, we've uh, largely done it within the major uh, urban centers, but it's also because the, the awareness has be, hasn't been uh, that good. So, you know, some people might not have had access but part of what we are currently working on is just making it available in all uh, all, all the major towns, uh, whether it's within Nairobi, Kisumu, Mombasa, and 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 really all, all the uh, all the places where our members. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much. For the people who've been wondering what is a vaccine, I believe this podcast from what we've just had, the discussions we've just had a few minutes ago have helped. So Dr. Karuma, I know the Pharmacy and Poisons Board has a pharmacovigilance uh, section. That means people can report some of the side effects that they get. I'm not sure if any of the people who have come to Good Life to get this vaccine have reported any side effects and if any what are some of the side effects so generally uh, we've been we've been on this uh, vaccine drive for, uh, for the last uh, uh, three years now uh, with old mutual is almost a year now if i'm not wrong uh, we've not picked a lot of uh, adverse effects we picked quite a few but we've not picked a lot of adverse effects as i said the most uh, common adverse effects are pain pain on the injection site uh, which clears after some time We've not had the major side effects like the, no, the anaphylaxis or uh, major uh, HR, uh, what, what, what I would call a major event. Maybe you could explain what anaphylaxis oh, is. Yeah. A, uh, severe allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. So we've not had those kind of reactions uh, in any of our stores. But that's a very good question because whenever we pick whatever kind of side effects we, 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 uh, we get, even those uh, on injection site, we normally report them through the pharmacovigilance uh, portal uh, through the PPB. Mm -hmm. So all of them are recorded there. All of them are also recorded as incidents in our stores. There are not many, as I said, because I've reviewed them. There are not many. So as uh, Dr. Tariz have said, it's generally a, a safe injection to have as mm -hmm. long as you uh, uh gone through the right processes, as in you've got an... Uh, the right recommendation, you're the right age, and everything that works out, it's a very safe vaccine. Mm -hmm. There's very safe vaccines, mm -hmm. yes. I was reading this morning at the CDC website, and, and I understand that there are different types of the pharmaco, the pneumono, pneumococcal vaccine, sorry. So which ones do we have in Kenya or at Good Life Pharmacy? Uh, uh, without mentioning uh, brand names, I'll say okay. we what we have is a, a, a pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Mm -hmm. It contains uh, 13 of the most common, uh, 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 it contains fragments of 13 of the most common bac uh, uh, bacteria that cause, cause pneumonia. Yeah. So it gives you that protection from uh, the, the 13 causative agents. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So earlier we were talking about not every pharmacy can have this um, vaccine. So what is required in terms of storage, supply chain? What do people need to do if maybe there's a pharmacist that needs to stock this so that their people can get it? What is required? Uh, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, all pharmacies that are registered by a pharmacy and poisons board should have the capability of uh, stocking these vaccines mm -hmm. because they have the right cold chain, uh, cold chain uh, ch uh, ch uh, products. They have the right cold chain products. Uh, 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 material mm -hmm. things that make a maintain cold chain they have the right personnel mm -hmm. so any pharmacy that is registered by the pharmacy and poisons board and approved practice in the country mm -hmm. should be able to carry all vaccines in this country mm -hmm. now the challenge comes that uh, some of the vaccines uh, are lost, actually don't call it a challenge there, there are three classifications of vaccines you have routine vaccines the ones that you get from your regular uh, in, uh, the public uh, hospitals we might not be able to keep those ones because those ones, you will get them from public hospitals at, at a subsidized rate. Mm -hmm. But for most voluntary vaccines, your pneumonia vaccine, your flu vaccines, you'll get them in the pharmacy. And any pharmacy that is registered in this country should have all the necessary uh, uh, equipments to keep them there, to stop them. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you very much. Dr. Chakaya, we are back to you. I remember you mentioned that pneumonia can kill. And I know some or rather a young person who was, I think, 20 years old. He just started feeling um, sick today, and then the following day he went to hospital, died, and then the, the autopsy said that he died of pneumonia. I'd like to know, like, how long does it take for pneumonia to kill? That's a very interesting question, and I, I would say uh, you can't put a figure to say pneumonia will kill in a day or pneumonia will kill in three days or a week or something. Mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to know that most people with pneumonia don't die of pneumonia. I think this is really important. Uh -huh. If you look at uh, research work that's been done all over the world, the death rates for pneumonia are under 5%. Uh -huh. So if you have 100 people with pneumonia, 
less than five people will die of their pneumonia. However, we need to know that of those that die, there are certain things that tend to uh, be associated with the risk of dying from pneumonia. So, for example, very young people, if, a, if, if, you, if you are a child uh, less than five years of age and the younger you are, the greater the risk that you could die of pneumonia if you get pneumonia. Uh, the older you are, greater than the age of 65, the greater the risk that you could die of pneumonia. Uh, if you have uh, um, chronic medical conditions, like we've said, kidney disease, HIV, the greater the risk that you could die of pneumonia if you get pneumonia. Now, for the young person who was only 20 years old, that was a very, very uncommon situation. Most young people of that age can get pneumonia for sure. Their rate of pneumonia is actually not that high compared with the others. And usually most people at that age don't die of pneumonia. So it's a bit surprising that that individual died of pneumonia. And the question, therefore, uh, that would run in the mind of any clinician is, uh, was he having an underlying condition? Did he get a jam that is not the usual kind of jams? Did he delay in getting medical treatment? Was he treated with the wrong medicine? There are so many possible cause, uh, possible explanation for that pneumonia death. But generally speaking, as long as people access medical care and good medical care for that matter, quality medical care, the death rate for pneumonia are very low. And all those deaths at the end of the day can be uh, prevented by appropriate treatment. And like we have said, um, vaccination helps to prevent many of those deaths. You don't get the pneumonia in the first place. Okay, thank you. We've talked about vaccination at length as one of the tools to prevent pneumonia and influenza. Do we have any other ways that people can prevent themselves from getting these diseases apart from vaccination that you would recommend? I think my colleague touched on that a little bit. I think the most important thing is what some people call healthy living. Being aware of your health and doing things that uh, uh, help you to preserve your, your health. And nutrition is top on that list. Uh, and it's good nutrition. In this country, I think we eat very badly because all we eat is big white ugali and a lot of meat and that's not good nutrition uh, I think there has to be in this country a big move towards uh, uh, educating our population that nutrition is health good nutrition is health number two is regular good doses of exercise this is very important when you exercise your immune system becomes a lot and it will pick up things that uh, Ordinarily, what may be in people who don't do this kind of thing, uh, you, you might be causing problems. Avoiding toxins, including the toxins that we tend to voluntarily take on our own. Smoking, for example, when you smoke, you, in, you introduce into your body thousands of small little poisons that over time will affect your health and that could lead to pneumonia. And Fourthly, alcohol, how much alcohol we take. Those, those are very basic things. So uh, good nutrition, exercise, uh, social networks, uh, re re reducing exposure to toxins and, and, and so on and so forth are very helpful. But there's one thing that I think I should talk about here, and that is the role of uh, air pollution. Air pollution at the home and air pollution outdoors. We live in an extremely polluted environment. And the more we continue to pollute our environment, the greater the risk of these diseases like pneumonia and, and, and many others. So at home, what are we using to cook our food? If we are using firewood or cow dung or whatever, and our homes are extremely polluted, the risk of uh, those who live in that home developing serious conditions like pneumonia is very high. But also how we go around in our cities, you know, with cars and uh, industries spewing smoke everywhere, that also increases our risk of getting pneumonia and many other conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, cancers, and so on and so forth. Thank you so much, Dr. Chakaya. We are coming to the tail end of our conversation this morning, and I just like 
my interviewers or interviewees rather to just say maybe the last word what they maybe have not asked what they feel people should know and I'll start with you Dr. Mat Matolo. Yeah so our uh, prevention is better than cure. I think we need to build uh, that uh, understanding uh, that culture of uh, healthy living and uh, taking the necessary vaccinations is actually part of uh, healthy living. So the information around the vaccines that one is eligible for can be provided readily uh, by, your, by your primary care doctor. But also you, if you research that, that's something that uh, can be done. So at Old Mutual, we are creating that awareness among our members. Uh, we have clearly specified that these are uh, benefits that they are able to access. Uh, at any point and we've told them how they can access it either through Good Life or any of the other uh, pharmacies that we work with. So we want to uh, ensure that people are taking care of themselves, they are taking the necessary vac uh, vaccinations so that they do not end up getting uh, you know, uh, diseases like uh, pneumonia or influenza that are going to uh, either uh, you know become uh, bad, it can lead to death, yeah, but, but most importantly, it's actually going to affect the quality of life. And and maybe just to mention, I think uh, the, the beauty about vaccination is that they're, they're one of the, 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 the most successful uh, inventions of uh, medicine. Uh, there are diseases that have actually been eradicated. Yeah, if you talk about things like smallpox. Yeah, so in the 70s, there was a concerted effort uh, led by the WHO and smallpox was actually eradicated. The last case was in uh, 1977, and since then, it's not been there. I think if you talk about uh, things like uh, polio, which used to cause a lot of uh, paralysis, uh, polio is almost on the verge of being eradicated uh, from the face of the earth. Yeah. It used to be in more than almost 200 countries in the 80s. Right now, it's probably two or three countries that still have... Uh, uh, wild circulation of uh, polio. So the uh, vaccines do work and uh, they can help people lead long and healthy lives. And that's what uh, the message that we want, uh, especially our for our members at All Mutual Health to know. Thank you so much. Dr. Chakaya. I want to thank uh, um, first uh, for being given this opportunity to, to be here. And I want to address, as we finalize this, I want to address one big issue, which is uh, uh, vaccine hesitancy, which is a big problem in our part of the world. Uh, the, there are groups of people in the world that have been and continue to be and uh, against vaccines for all sorts of reasons. And uh, the most common reason is that, uh, you know, this might affect fertility, this may be a depopulation agenda, and so on and so forth. But I think we need to go by the science. Vaccines, as far as I know, are developed through a very rigorous scientific process. And they are safe and effective. And so when you hear people say, this is a depopulation agenda, please cross-check that information. If there was a depopulation agenda against Africans, for example, how come that in COVID-19 vaccination, 90% of the high-income countries vaccinate? No, 90% of the population of high-income countries was vaccinated. Here in Kenya, only 30-something percent of us were vaccinated. Why would anyone vaccinate their own people to kill them when in fact the enemy is the African? You know, there are some very basic things that one should cross-check before believing that some scientifically produced product uh, is uh, detrimental to health. I think we need to cross-check information before we act on that information. Uh, and I think for me, vaccines, like my colleague has already said, uh, provides not just, the, it's not the only answer, certainly to our healthcare problem, but it's a major contributor uh, to the answer of uh, infectious disease and how we manage infectious disease now and in the future. So, Dr. Karuma, last but not least. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity and the platform to be able to discuss about uh, vaccine-preventable diseases, yeah. influenza, uh, pneumonia, for that matter. I want to talk about availability. 
we have a lot of vaccines available in this country. And I'm saying from a, punk, a part of a person who stocks and uh, sells, every year we go to the uh, incineration room where we incinerate our expired products and we'll always get a vaccine that is being incinerated. I heard what Dr. Chakaya said, how 3 million people are dying uh, 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 due to vaccine, uh, due to pneumonia globally. Part of that, of those people, are happy, that is happening in Kenya. Yet, we are incinerating vaccines that can be put in arms and make sure that people don't get uh, these uh, vaccine preventable diseases. Yeah. Please come to, uh, to the pharmacy. If you don't feel like uh, visiting your hospital, although hospital is also a good place to visit, but if you feel you don't, you, you feel more comfortable coming to the pharmacy, come to the pharmacy and get uh, you get vaccinated. Number two, to my colleagues, let's uh, start stocking these things so that they are available closest to uh, the, uh, our, our, our customers, our clients, our patients, our friends. Let's have these things as close as possible, uh, these products as close as possible to you, the people we start. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. To our listeners, uh, our time has come to an end. I feel like we should go on and on and on because I'm just thirsty to get that knowledge of these experts that are here with us and they're giving us information free of charge. I know if you'd go to Dr. Chakaya's clinic, you'd have to pay for this information, but here you're getting it free of charge. So if you have any questions, you can comment on our social media pages and we'll be able to reach to you after getting the feedback from our experts. And if there's one thing that I've gotten from this discussion today is don't listen to me, listen to the science. That is something that my colleague Leon Lidigo likes saying and Please listen to the science. The vaccines are safe. You should get them if you're eligible to get them. Thank you very much. See you next time. 